Hi, my name is Matt. Um, I was in project management for 15, 20 years uh, with the same company. Um, it was an intense job, and that took its toll on myself and my family. And I, you know, even at family functions, uh, I would be there, but I'd have my laptop, I'd have my phone. Um, I was engaged with the job more than being in the moment with my family. I've known for years that I needed to leave that job, um, but I kept stopping myself from doing it because it's our income. I'm the man of the house, I need to provide. I gave it to God and I just prayed on it. I started doing art again and drawing, which I hadn't done in 20 years. And, um, you know, put it out there and got some positive feedback on it, uh, which was encouraging. And I was also watching my wife and the business she's built and, uh, you know, how successful it's becoming for her and went and got my real estate license to, you know, join her team. Here we are uh, six months later now since I've left the job and we've got a, a charity organization that we've built. Um, I've partnered with her on our family business now um, and I've, you know, opened my own online art studio. Um, but more importantly, I'm drawing again and I'm engaged with my family again. Um, but the most important piece to all of that was in this, I don't know, uh, drive that I had for leadership positions and to have the large scale projects to, to manage. Um, I sort of found what true leadership is, which was when I was baptized last Sunday, to be able to do that with my kids, to have them see me get baptized um, and then be there for, for their baptism was, and my wife as well, um, was huge for us. And that's my transformation story. Well, good morning, Generations Christian Church. It's so good to see you. What an incredible story from Matt. And as I've gotten to know Matt, just love his heart and his history with that. Well, today we're going to jump right in. So uh, I don't want to brag, uh, but uh, I've been working most of my life. Uh, if I had a dollar when I was growing up for every time that my grandma rates would tell me how hard she worked, how long she worked, how hard you're supposed to work, uh, I would be a very rich man at this point. And so I decided in the fifth grade to jump into the workforce. Fifth grade, jump into the workforce. So I've got a picture I'm going to show you here. Uh, I became in the fifth grade um, a male model. And so it was, it was difficult. Uh, those of you who've opened up your JCPenney's catalogs, um, anybody remember Montgomery Wards? I was uh, featured in the Montgomery Wards um, deal. Never could hit Sears and Roebuck. They were too tough. Um, but Montgomery Wards loved me. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I wasn't a male model. But that is really me in the fifth grade. So those of you who felt like you had a tough fifth grade, uh, You'll feel better about yourself now. But I wore the, I mean, I wore that belt though. Look at that. Like, whew. I went to a Christian school, so we had a uh, dress code, and I made that dress code work. I worked it. Well, it was your first time at Generations. That is your welcome. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, my name is Jason Rates. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're in week eight of Transformed. We are going through this series. We've, do we've dove into how we can experience transformational health in all areas of our life. We look at our spiritual health and our mental and emotional and physical and relational and financial, and now we dive into our vocational health. Because here's the reality about our vocational health. So much of our time is going to be spent working. So much of our time. Uh, average person will spend about 90,000 hours working in their lifetime. 90,000 hours. It's like a third of your life that you're going to spend working. And so it, it's so important for us uh, to understand how we can have vocational health. How we can have vocational health. Uh, some experts, if you read the, what's happening with all the workforce in America right now, uh, month of August, 4 million people left their jobs. We're calling it like the season of the great resignation. People are leaving their jobs. Most people quit their jobs because they don't feel appreciated or they have a bad manager. Um, uh, eight out of 10 millennials say that they'll leave their job in the next year if they don't feel appreciated for. Uh, I, I hope they never have to work for my grandma because she was tough. I'm, I'm like, Grandma, I'm only five. I can't use the shop vac. Stop yelling at me. Enough already. 
Uh, but the reality is we do want to be in places that have healthy work environments. And we do want to be in a place because we're giving so much time. And especially for those of us who have trusted in Jesus as our Savior. Especially for those of us because we represent Jesus in our workplaces. And so we want to be able to represent him. Now, speaking of work, work is important. And so I went through, and I wanted to get a little audience participation on this. I went through all the songs uh, over the years that have kind of ex made us experience work. So I'm going to read some lyrics to a song, and then I'm going to ask you who sang it. See if you know who it is. Okay, first song. We dig, 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 dig from early morn till night. We dig, 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 dig up everything in sight. We dig up diamonds by the score. A thousand rubies sometimes more, but we don't know what we dig them for. We dig, 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 dig. Hi-ho. Hi-ho. <laughs> Off to work. We, did anybody know that? Nobody knows the dig, dig, dig part. They just know the hi-ho. And who sang that one? Seven Dwarfs, yes. Song number two, it's been a hard day's night. I've been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night. I should have been sleeping like a... Yeah, who sang that one? Yeah, that one's the Beatles, right, right, right. Uh, song three, you get up every morning from your alarm clock's warning. Take the 815 to the city. There's a whistle up above, people pushing, people shoving, and I'll be taking care of business. That's right. Anybody know who sang that? BTO, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Thank you very much. Song four, well, I tumble out of bed and stumble in the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition, yawn and stretch, try to come to life. Jump in the shower and the blood starts pumping. Out in the street, the traffic starts jumping with folks like me on the job from nine to five. Nine to five. Who sang that one? Wow. Dolly Parton, that's right. Um, this song, there's really no lyrics except for this. It's a really amazing song. I wish I would have wrote songs because everybody knows this song. She works hard for the money. So hard for it. That's pretty much the song over and over. And so who sang that one? Donna Summer. Right, last song. Uh, this one's a little inappropriate, so close your ears if you don't want to hear it. Uh, take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. My woman done left me. Took all my reason. I was working for, but better not try to stand in my way as I'm walking out the door. Take this job and shove it. Anybody know who sang that? Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, we need to get you a prize, some type of award. Because no, nobody in the first service, they're like crickets. I was like, Johnny Paycheck. They're like, who? That was amazing. Here's what we see in scripture. Work is good. Work is hard. Work is amazing. God created man. He created man in Genesis 1 and then he put him to work. He was supposed to take care of the garden and then the man and the woman sinned and then their work got even harder because they had to work the fields and it was even harder. And so often hard work is like this betrayed, it's like it's an enemy in the world. Oh, you know. Uh, and so the reality is that sometimes people think they can never experience vocational health. Uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 9, 10 tells us, uh, whatever your hand finds to do with all of your might, no excuses allowed. Work hard, work hard. Then Paul later in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Do it for the glory of God. Now, to be honest, in my life, I, I love to work. I have always loved to work. Uh, as soon as I could, I, I had a job. I, was a, I had a paper route at, at the age of 12. And then at 12, my, my dad worked in construction, so I found myself on job sites all over the place. And that was most of my teenage years and 20s. And uh, I have I, loved those jobs. Then I got a job cutting lawns. And then all of a sudden it was five lawns and then 10 lawns and then 15 lawns. And I spent my summers cutting grass and I loved it. I sit on my riding lawnmower and push my mower and I had my Walkman. You guys remember Walkmans? They were like these big yellow boxes. And those of you under 30, there was this piece of plastic with tape and you, you put it in there and it made music happen in your ears. It was amazing. But I would cut lawns listening to things like James, artists like James Taylor. And I mean, just, just in, you know, I mean, just, it was awesome. I, I loved those jobs. Then when I was finally old enough at 16, I got a job at Michigan Avenue and Greenfield at Ponda Grossa Restaurant. Like it was amazing. Listen, I'm so sorry. If you own a Ponderosa, I'm very, very sorry. I'm very sorry. If you're listening to this online, you're the CEO of Ponderosa. I apologize. But uh, I worked at Ponderosa and I learned very quickly uh, what work was like. And not everybody is 
going to be nice to you at work and everybody's going to push and try to get ahead and how do I do this as I'm a Christian and there was five of us from my high school and they called us the Fab Five because it was the same time as the Fab Five from the University of Michigan basketball and so they called us the Fab Five and we'd work and I had to wear my bow tie and I was a waiter and I had my apron and I'd go to church I'd go to church and then I would go to work on Sundays and then I would I would experience something that I wasn't ready for in my short 16 years Christians can be really awful Sorry, I'm sorry, but like Sunday afternoon was horrendous at work. People were yelling at, they were dressed to the hilt, they got Bibles on the tables, and they're like, you better get more food in this buffet right now. I paid $4.10. I want my, and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't know what I'm, and so I experienced that for the first time. Here's what I hope you take away from the message today. In absolutely every way you possibly can, honor God with your work. In absolutely every way you possibly can. Honor God with your work. You want to achieve vocational health. You, you want to be used in your workplace. You want to be used with the skills and the talents that God's given you. Honor God with your work. One of the best things my dad taught me early on, I, I can remember this conversation over and over and over. He said, Jason, when you get a job, do whatever you can to help lighten your boss's load. Whatever you can. Like anticipate what they'll ask for, what your boss We'll ask for it and do it. And then do it a little bit further than they ever anticipate. It was the best advice I ever get. I've tried to live that out all these years. Failed at times, yes, but it was just incredible. I love what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says this about work. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not human masters, since you know that you'll receive inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. Wouldn't it be something if we approached our vocations that way? Instead of looking at it, it's like, oh, I got to work again. Oh, they're asking me to do. Wouldn't it be amazing if we, whatever we do, we work at it with all of our heart. Instead of like maybe just doing it the minimum. Instead of just getting enough to get ahead. God wants to see every worker ultimately, like they work for him. And so God promises to reward those who work for them if you honor him with your work. So how do we honor God? How do we honor God with our work? Well, to honor God with your work means that you give God the regard, respect, reverence, admiration, adoration, awe, praise, submission, and obedience which are due to him. Oh, is that how you approach your work? Because sometimes we walk into church and we honor God with all of those things. And then on Monday morning we walk into work and maybe sometimes our coworkers wouldn't even know we were a Christ follower. Ooh, sorry, I'm sorry. Ooh, but I'm just like, that's how we honor God. Like, honor God means to worship him in our attitudes, our affections, and our actions. Jesus sums it up in Matthew 22, 37. Love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So in everything that you do, love God. Love God, honor him. So then when I say work, honor God with your work, what do, you, what do I mean? Because there's so many things that it can mean. I mean three things. How you provide for your family, nine to five. Like, how you take care of taking care of life all that way, how you build God's kingdom, your ministry, and then how you fulfill your life's calling, your heart. Because your nine to five may not be your life's calling. It may not be. Nine to five may just be how I provide for my family, but my life's calling is totally different. And maybe some of you are in a season where you've put in your year's work and now you're able to concentrate on your life's calling or you're able to concentrate on building God's kingdom. And so in absolutely every way possible, honor God. Isn't it great when you meet heroes and they, they, they live up to the expectations or the dreams that you've heard about them? Years ago, I was um, at a, a global leadership summit conference in Chicago, this big giant church, which we are a virtual site for the global leadership summit. I hope next August you will attend. It is an incredible two days of leadership. Whatever place of life you find you're in, it will be incredible. But I was walking out of the fourth floor exit and I almost walk into this man. And as I Step back from a second, I realize who he is. And he is Dan Cathy, the president and CEO of a little company called Chick-fil-A. Now, I'm a simple guy. This is all you need to know about me. I, I, I love a few things. My wife, I love Jesus. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my family. Um, I really love Chick-fil-A. I do. 
I don't know what's in, after my family, if it's Chick-fil-A, Tom Brady, or Hootie and the Blowfish. I don't know what the order is. They're sort of inner, but I love all things about Chick-fil-A. I study the company because I love companies that run with efficiency and take care of people. And so I ran into him and I'm like, <gasps> you're the chicken guy. Like, I'm like, this is Dan Kathy. I haven't met many billionaires. And this, he was on the phone and I stood over to this and I was like, <sighs> And finally, I, he hung up and he talked to me and he found out I was a pastor and it was ridiculous how he switched from, like he just, all he was curious about was me and asked me questions and thanked me for being a pastor. I mean, it was just, I'm like asking questions and I ask him for the photo and, and so now I have the photo. And then he gave me a little pile of free, free chicken cards. <laughs> and I used them all, but I kept one and I keep them in a frame. I should have brought it. I keep them in a frame in the photo and I take that in the Chick-fil-A every time I go. And I'm like, I... I have, I have a, anybody? No? But this guy, this billionaire who runs this amazing company, he walks away from me. He's not even in one of his places, but there's a bunch of trash on the floor and this billionaire guy who talks about, I've heard him talk about how we take care of our buildings over and over and over. He bends down, he picks up the trash and he straightens something else out. And, he, and I'm like, what just happened right now? I don't understand. Why, why is he doing those things? Oh, because he lives out what he does. He honors God with his work. And that's what we want to do. And we want to look at David from the Old Testament because David shows us this beautiful way of how we can honor God with our work, how we can do that. If you don't know much about the life of David, uh, he had glaring flaws, but he was described as a man after God's own heart. He's from the tribe of Judah, which is called the tribe of kings. Uh, Ruth from the Old Testament and Boaz, he was their great grandson. He's the youngest of Jesse's sons. He's from this town called Bethlehem, uh, which is also called the town of David. Uh, he's God's anointed one. He was a shepherd and a musician. He was a great slayer and a warrior. He was uh, Israel's greatest king. He fell deeply and committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he had her husband Uriah killed. And even in the midst of that, we just see God working through his life all these years. And David shows us that in absolutely every way you possibly can, honor God with your work. So how do we honor God with our work? How do we honor God with our work? Our nine to five, our ministry work, how we serve the kingdom of God and our life's calling. Well, we learn a few lessons from David. The first lesson is David knew who he was. He absolutely knew who he was. And that's your lesson. Do you know who you are? So often you introduce yourself to somebody you're like, hi, I'm Jason. I'm the executive pastor of Generations Christian Church. Okay, that's not totally wrong, but we get our identity so stuck up in what we do. Our identity is not what we do, it's who we are. And if you've trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are the son or daughter of the living God. That's who you are. So, so often I've met people over the years and they'll be like, Pastor, I want to talk to you. I'm just in a rut. And I'll say, what do you, what do, you do for a living? And they'll say, well, I'm, I'm just an accountant. No, you're not. You are the son of the living God in an accountant's office because he's using you to honor him with your work and you're showing how a Christ follower is lived in your office. Like that's who you are. That's not just what you do. And so there's this part in David's story in 1 Samuel 16 where Samuel the prophet is coming to anoint the new king and he comes to this town and he's got to go to Jesse because Jesse has all these boys. And he walks up and he says, hey, give me the boys because I'm going to anoint one of them. And then they go through all seven and none of them are the right ones. And then in verse 11 in, in chapter 16, he says, so he asked Jesse, are all these the sons you have? And then Jesse says, they're still the youngest. Sometimes when I read this though, I think about Jesse. My childhood had the Duke boys, you remember? And I think of Uncle Jesse sometimes. And you're like, oh, I still got the youngest. <laughs> like, no, I don't think Jesse was that way. But Jesse says he's still tending sheep. So Samuel says, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully. This is crazy to imagine, right? Like David had to be shocked. Like he gets there and it's like all the brothers and he's like, what party did I miss? The party was none of the brothers were the, the anointed one. You are. And David, his name actually means beloved. What did you want a king with like a name like giant? slayer or you know amazing leader Jesse's brothers the oldest brother was Eliab which means God is my father that's not a bad name to have then it was Abinadab which is my father is noble then it was Shema which means astonishment 
And I, I kind of I think of it like this way. I asked my, my son who takes pictures of action figures. I said, well, could you take me one of this kind of moment where it's like young David looking up at these big giant brothers, right? Like how do I even compare? Well, here's how he compared because Jesse anointed David. He was the anointed king. David was the unlikely king. He was not the king Israel expected, but he was the king that God wanted for them. And similarly, we see in the New Testament that Jesus was not what many religious leaders expected the Messiah to be. Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem to a virgin uh, mother and uh, came from an earthly family of humble means, seems like nothing like the Savior Israel ever imagined. They expected a warrior king to come, but God gave them a suffering servant who humbly gave himself for the sake of others. Many people failed to recognize who Jesus was, and in the end, they put him to death. And they imagined a Messiah who would come and destroy their enemies. But Jesus the Messiah came and he gave his enemies a seat at the table. Jesus was God in flesh. His heart was completely pure. He may not have been externally impressive, but he embodied the perfect love and grace of God here in this earth. And that's the story of David, what was on the inside. Everybody judged David on the outside, but it was on the inside that counts. And so maybe for you, your identity is so wrapped up into your exact job title and not who you are on the inside. Maybe you act like you're someone that you're not at work and you're not showing them the inside character, which is you're honoring God with everything that you do. You have to remember about your identity. Your identity is not your job. Your identity is not your job. Your identity is not based on what you do, not in your skills, not in your charm, not in your perceived beauty or lack of beauty, not in your bank account, not in any followers you have on Instagram. If you've trusted in Jesus, confessed your sins, taken the obedient step of baptism, your identity is based in Jesus. You are a child of God. You're a child of God. Five years into marriage, I mixed that up. I had been a youth pastor. I loved being a youth pastor. Our ministry was growing like crazy. We had all these kids coming and I was just wrapped up into my own kingdom. Look at what Jason has done. And my wife and I are on a retreat with a few hundred students and Saturday night. And if you've never been on a student retreat on Saturday night, you have to go because the worship will cause you to just confess that you have not served kids more because it's so powerful to hear these teenagers sing out. And I'm in the back of the room and I'm watching all these teenagers, hands raised, singing. I'm crying and my wife walks up to me and she's crying and she's like, I'm like, isn't this amazing? God's moving. And she looks at me and she says, um, you care more for all of these kids than me. They could ask you to do anything and you'll just go do it right away. But I gotta beg you and beg you and beg you and beg you to spend time with me. And so I learned pretty quick that you could actually lose your spouse or the people that you love if you're addicted to your identity and your job. And that was a huge changing point in our marriage 15 years ago. Your identity is not your job. Here's your identity in case you need a reminder. You are his special possession. You are chosen, handpicked by God who created the universe. You are treasured. You are irreplaceable. You are loved beyond compare. You are worth dying for. You are forgiven. You are his child. You are secured for all eternity. You are set free. You are precious to him. You are set apart. That's your identity. Maybe some of you needed to come here this morning so just you could be reminded that you are accepted, significant, and a beloved child of God. Henry Nouwen put it this way, Jesus came to announce to us that an identity based on success, popularity, and power is a false identity and illusion. Loudly and clearly, he says, you are not what the world makes you, but you are children of God. Before we we leave this point, it's just so important to point out. 1 Samuel 16 says that Jesse had seven sons pass before him. Seven sons. And the Lord didn't choose any of these. And, and just, Samuel actually asked, do you have any more sons? So imagine that moment, like those big giant sons who have amazing names and all these skills and they're just passed over. Maybe you have been passed over in your life or something. Maybe a job was not given to you and you were passed over for it. But here's the reality. In the Hebrew language, the Old Testament, uh, the number seven means completion. So we're all supposed to think that there's no more sons. There's seven sons. It's completed. But the problem is David is number eight. He is son number eight. And eight in Hebrew means resurrection and regeneration. And it is a number for a new beginning. So eight is seven plus one. And since it comes just after seven, which itself signifies an end to something, the eight is also associated with the beginning of a new era, of a new era. 
Do you know that David is in the lineage of Jesus Christ and David's lineage ushered the way for Jesus to come, which gave us the new covenant in a new way. And so Samuel needed to go through all seven sons to get to the one who was going to lead the new beginning. So here's the, here's the idea for you. Maybe your day is coming. Maybe you have been passed over. Maybe you have not been chosen. Maybe you have not been picked. But be faithful and honor God with your work because your day could be coming. Your day could be coming. So in absolutely every way possible, honor God with your work. David knew who he was. Lesson number one. Lesson number two. David worked hard and used the skills. He worked hard for his money. He worked hard for his money. That's not in scripture. I don't know who's saying it. Can you help me? What's that? Donna Summers. I do know who that was. It was in my notes. David worked hard for his money, but David had skills and he worked hard. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, 18 says, one of the servants answered, I've seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. David was a worship pastor and King Saul was sick because the spirit of God had left him and he was struggling and demented. And so he would have musicians come in and someone had heard David play and brought David to King Saul and King Saul loved him because it says that David was also strong and was a warrior. And so God get, created music and gave it the capability to touch people with great power because it's so powerful and music can be used for great good or great evil, because it so powerfully communicates to our inner being. This morning driving in, me and the, car, me and the kids in the car, a hymn comes on the radio. In an instant, I flash back to standing next to my grandma Rates in church, listening to her sing how great there are. I mean, it's just so powerful. And King Saul didn't need the kind of like, oh, bless you, kind of musician. Do you know that kind of musician? The kind of musician who was told their entire life they're talented, but once they get on stage, everyone's like, oh, bless you. Oh, bless you. Oh, bless you. He didn't need that kind of musician. He needed like a worship pastor. He needed a skilled musician. And so why did it also matter that David was also brave and a warrior? Because worship ministry, what happens? It's a constant spiritual battleground. David needed a man of character and a warrior to effectively lead Saul in worship and minister to him. And do you, do you know why? Because music is so powerful. Do you know in churches, I don't mean to step in anything, but how many battles there have been over worship over the years? Like literal battles, like churches dividing over how loud or soft or what kind of music or which hymn or which song because it gets so intertwined in our identity. And it's so important because when we step in and we gather together and we're led in worship, like walls can be broken down. Like we sang today, chains can be broken. Chains can be broken. The worship guys, they make fun of me a lot because I sit in the front and they're like, you're never, you're never like real animated. And I'm like, I, I'm not. Because if I, if I do get animated, um, I start crying uncontrollably because that's what worship does to me. So I just try to be stoic. But that's how powerful worship is. That's how powerful it is because it can break the chains in our life. So David was a worship pastor. He was also a shepherd. 1 Samuel 17 says, but, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued. A shepherd's just not like a sit there kind of person. It's a, I'm gonna protect my sheep at all odds. And he was so skilled. That sometimes we get the story of David's messed up that he had this, he was this little tiny guy and he had a slingshot and he beat the, he beat the giant. Oh, it's a slingshot. That's not the case. A slingshot is not. I mean, you can knock out a pigeon or something. But he was a shepherd who was a, 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 a skilled uh, slinger. Like he, I mean, he, could sl he would have a sling, he would have two pieces of string and a piece of leather, put a rope in it. He could knock birds out. It would be like, like right now, in honor of like, you know, 1 p.m. today with the Bucks, if like I, if I had Zach like move up all over the auditorium and I just showed you like my, my skill, like, like, oh, that was how powerful I threw it. Cause this thing, <laughs> this thing is power, power. I mean, it is something else. But David, I mean, it was so powerful. He wasn't approaching Goliath with like a little slingshot. He had this amazing skill and he was dangerous. And so some of you are really good at different things. I learned early on that I can get up and communicate in front of people. I started an MBA years ago. I went into my first class. Everybody had to get up in front of everybody, share what they did. And, so, you know, a guy was like, I'm John. I'm an account executive. And another guy was like, I'm a CFO. And another lady was like, I'm a, uh, a human resources person. And I get up and I'm like, I'm a junior high pastor. 
And the, their faces, like they were judging me from like the get-go. Like, I don't mean to speak ill on them because they're all good friends still this day. But like, they're just ju- like, who are you, a pastor? This is like business. This is important stuff. MBA. Uh, here's the thing, though. Week three, when the whole class figured out the pastor could communicate, guess who everybody wanted on their team? This guy. <laughs> this guy. I may have not have known their cool little ex- account sheets, but I could get up and uh, communicate and sell. And that, they all wanted me. I was like, all right, in your face. In your face. <laughs> But how do you use your skill to honor God? Some of you have skills that you haven't even used yet. How do you use those skills? Okay, I don't have time for this, but I have to share it. Um, There's another story in David's life, later in life, 2 Samuel, where he's sitting around with his mighty warriors. These are the guys who were with him from when Saul was chasing him in caves, all the way up through the kingdom, through everything. And now they're back at war with the Philistines and they're sitting around. And David says these words. He says, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. He was remembering his childhood. It's like if I remember back to the hose water from 6615 Winthrop in Detroit. Like I think back like the hose water was like those really nice like Voss waters. You know, it was a hose water. But I think back to those days and I'm like, oh, I would just love that hose water again. So David's mighty men, this is what they do. So the three mighty warriors, they got up, they broke through the Philistine lines, they drew water from the well at the gate of Bethlehem and they carried it back to David. Like that's the way that they honored him. So how, is, how are you honoring God at your workplace? I will tell you this. Like, I absolutely love and believe in the vision that God's given our Pastor Johnny and the elders in this church. And for me, like, this is, this is my job to be one of those mighty men so I can help go and take care of what needs to happen. And we need you to join us, men and women, to say, you know what? I'll get up. I'll go get the water from Bethlehem. I mean, it's a long trip. We'll get airfare, passports, but we'll do it. But it's time. It is time for some of us to be able to do that. I love this quote from Augustine. He said, pray as though everything depended on God. Work as though everything depended on you. In absolutely every way you can, honor God with your work. Last lesson. David faced small and large giants and kept going. He didn't just face one giant. His dad doubted him. I I don't know that life. I have lived a very blessed life to have a father that I have not had to navigate that with. I have talked to hundreds of teenagers over the years who have had the opposite, who did not have a dad who believed in them and criticized them and ridiculed them. Maybe you have that same thing. Well, you're in good company with David because he had a dad who doubted him. He had brothers who disapproved of him, another giant. He had a boss who looked at him and said, you can't defeat the giant. So he had small giants. He had small giants. Just like that little giant, small giants. Then he had the large giant. And in 1 Samuel 17, it says, Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. And he said to him, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed God. David by his gods. And he said, come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. So then as the Philistine Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle to meet him. He ran towards his giant, reaching in his bag, taking out a stone, slung it and struck the Philistine on the head. The stone sank into his forehead. He fell face down. So David triumphed over him. And then with a sword, he chopped off his head like Goodness, what a story. We all know that story. But here's maybe the part you don't know in the story. I think maybe your Goliaths might not be as big as you think they are. I will never get ahead at my current company. I will never be able to launch out on my own business. I will never be able to start the YouTube channel or whatever you're dreaming of. This is an actual, I tried to get as much as, as close to Goliath as I could. Like this is, this is, this is giant. Like, Of course, from afar, he looks so crazy dangerous. 200 pounds of armor, a javelin, a spear, a shield. He had a a shield bearer come. Like he couldn't even lift his own shield. He had a person come out for him. But from afar, Goliath was screaming every day. Some of you come out and fight me. And the Israelites just hunkered down in fear until David came because David knew who he was. He knew his identity was 
being God's child and he was the anointed king, David used his skill of his slingshot, he, his sling, he knew his skill. And so he just would not let someone speak ill of his God. And so he charged towards him. Now here's why the story of Goliath is maybe not all that, maybe we think of it differently. Science, medicine has taught us over the years that other people with giant Ism, like it's a real thing. There's a guy in the 40s, Robert Wood Wilson, he eight foot five, Andre the Giant, right? And was almost eight feet. People who are born that way, they actually have a real tumor that lodges themselves and it kind of presses up against the optic nerves. And so maybe just possibly Goliath, when he yelled at David, why do you come at me with the sticks? David didn't come at him with sticks. He had a shepherd's staff. He couldn't see him. That's why his shield bearer had to bring him out to battle because Goliath couldn't see. He wasn't fast. And so David comes up, a skilled warrior, a skilled with his sling, and he charges towards the Goliath, whips the stone, which modern science and technology all tells us is probably as powerful as a 45 caliber gun because they could get it around in six times in a second. And by the time that stone was released, it would travel 35 meters 35 meter, I mean, a foot, and he went and it hit him right. Goliath had no idea it was coming. So here's my thought to you today. Maybe your Goliath at work, your Goliath and your vocation, what's holding you back from living the life's calling that you want to, maybe it's not as big as you think. Maybe it's not as dangerous as you think. Maybe it is, because you get up close, like 200 pounds, sword, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is, is that maybe God is telling you to move on from a cur current company to do something else, like Matt in the story. Or maybe God is telling you to start your own thing. Maybe those giants aren't as big. So in absolutely every way you possibly can, honor God with your work. Don't be the worker. Don't be the person who represents Jesus in your workplace, whether it's in your nine to five, whether it's serving, you serve here at this church or you serve at Metropolitan Ministries or in your life's calling. Don't be the person who just on the outside has it all together. Do you know those kind of people? They work in the workplace. They're friends with everybody. They know what's going on. You know, they're, they kind of have this big game, but then they never follow through, right? Do you know those kind of people? It's like the kind of people who... Uh, when work gets hard and it gets all shaken up. And it's those people who are like, something bad's about to happen. And they're about to explode because work is just so difficult. And when they, oh. <laughs> when they do finally, they realize that it's just an empty shell. There's, there's, they have no character. They have no integrity. They have no dignity. They're not honoring God with their lives. Don't, don't be that worker. Be the person Now, here's the thing. This is actually like fire for me because my last Coke was December 5th, 2017. I don't drink this stuff anymore. Um, so this is like, whew. But, but, but be the person that what's on the inside is honoring to God and it's just a natural overflow on the outside that you walk into your workplace and you represent Jesus Christ you are his ambassador. And so the moments that you want to talk poor about your boss, you don't because that's not something that God would do. The moments that you uh, want to, you're maybe pushed by another boss or a coworker to cut corners, fudge the numbers. That's not something you do because you're honoring God with your work. The day that a coworker is falling apart and you take them aside and you say, hey, can I pray with you? Like that's honoring God at work. So be the person in absolutely every way you possibly can to honor God with your work. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for this time together. God, we just pray that we would be men and women who would honor you. We would honor you with our lives, with how we worship, with how we work. God, that we would bring you adoration and awe and reverence. And God, we would represent you in our workplaces. That whatever we put our hands to, God, we will honor you. And so God, we just pray that this would be our time to do that. Today we would walk out differently and we would experience a kind of health with our vocation that we never have. Because God, today we've made a commitment to honor you with our work. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen.